Hi, good morning, welcome to the latest vlog from KBC, Kinmo Bay Church. And uh, we're bringing through 100 men and women of the Bible. And uh, if you have a Bible near you, I'd like you to read uh, a passage and then come back to me. John chapter 19, verse uh, 1 through to verse 18. And while I'm getting myself straightened up here, you go away and read that and come back and uh, we'll be ready for you. Just press pause and then come back. So that was John 19, 1 to 18 that you've read, I hope. And we're thinking today about a man called Pilate. Now, Pilate was a Roman official. He was the prefect, which meant he was the governor of the Roman province, province of Judea. He's not really a very important man in the Roman Empire. Important men weren't sent to be prefects in meaningless backwaters like Judea. But like all men, I guess he probably had some ambition of his own. Maybe he would maybe think, if I do a good job here, my name will get known back in Rome. Maybe I'll gain a more prestigious position or a promotion somewhere better than this place. I want to think for a few minutes this morning of the time when this otherwise insignificant man in the big scheme of the Roman Empire comes face to face with the very God who made him. Suddenly, Pilate is not just a bit part player in the Roman Empire, but he's about to take centre stage in the greatest story ever told. So I want to refer to that passage that I hope you've just read uh, and hopefully you've got your Bible beside you and we'll just run through what we've learned. In verse 1, Pilate has Jesus taken and flogged. Now this follows the, the first trial before Pilate when he had found no fault with Jesus. He had an interesting discussion with Jesus, you might recall, on the nature of truth. You can look at that later. And he attempted to establish exactly who Jesus was and who Jesus said he was. And as part of his interactions with the chief priests who had handed Jesus over to Pilate, Pilate had tried to get them to deal with Jesus themselves. But they had pushed him back Pilate's way. And then in verses 4 and 5 we see him present Jesus to the Jews, once more asserting that he can find nothing wrong, I can find no fault in this man. Verse 6, he rejects the crowd's urgent demands that he should crucify Jesus. Once again, he tells them that if they want to crucify him, they should do it themselves. But then, verse 7 and 8, we read he becomes afraid because of the Jews' reports that Jesus had claimed to be the Son of God. And in verses 9 and 10, we see him return to question Jesus some more inside the palace. He reminds Jesus who he is dealing with. He tells him his fate is very much in Pilate's hands. And Jesus tells him somewhat enigmatically, whatever power he thinks he has is merely borrowed. More accurately, as being allowed by his Father, Almighty God himself. And then finally, in verse 12, it tells us that from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. Now, we don't know how he tried or how hard he tried or how often he tried, but we do read what stopped him from succeeding because he hears threats against his own name, against his own reputation as the Jews ramp up the pressure on him to do things their way and to have Jesus crucified. So he says, if you, they say to him rather, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. <laughs> in other words, Caesar won't be happy with you, Pilate. He'll assume that you're in on it and it won't end well for you. You'll be passed over for promotion. Then you'll be sent to some even more remote outpost for the rest of your working life. And that's if Caesar even lets you live at all after this almighty mess that you've presided over. So then we see what happens. He capitulates. Verses 13, 14, he has Jesus brought out once more. He takes his place in the judgment seat at a place called Gabbatha, above the pavement where Jesus is paraded before the baying mob once more. Here is your king, says Pilate, surrendering Jesus really and surrendering himself. 
And so in verse 15, the crowd yelled their howls of, Take him away, crucify him. And Pilate responds, ask them one final time, Shall I crucify your king? At this, the chief priests call back, We have no king but Caesar. And so Jesus' fate is sealed. And then finally, verse 16, we see Pilate hand over Jesus to be crucified. So what can we say about Pilate in this uh, incredible episode with Jesus? Pilate thought he had power. He was a man accustomed to speaking and having people under him listen. If he said jump, the normal response would be how high? And so when in verse 10 he tells Jesus that he has the power to free him or crucify him, he fully believes what he's saying. And this will be a conversation he's had many times before around Gabbatha or in the palace as he's met with men on death row. But Pilate's power is a mirage. Pilate's power and his authority is fickle. And we see in this exchange between Pilate and the crowd how Pilate's so-called power diminishes and dissipates through his own fear. Fear of what will happen to him if he makes the wrong decision. He has a choice to make. The choice is clear. One, do the right thing by the law. That would mean freeing Jesus. After all, repeatedly he has been unable to find any basis to make a charge against Jesus. Or, two, do the right thing by himself. And to save his own skin, he chooses to do the right thing politically. He turns Jesus over to be killed, despite his obvious innocence. This, though, will keep the angry mob at bay. This will keep the nagging chief priests of Pilate's back. This will avert any bad reports getting to the ears of Caesar back in Rome. Pilate's worried. He's worried about what he might lose, his reputation, his job security, maybe even his life. He's unaware that he is playing out a part in the original passion play, the whole scene being orchestrated by God himself. Why? To achieve his eternal purposes of salvation. On the other hand, by great contrast, Jesus' authority in this passage is authentic. It's powerful. And his power is shown through his meekness. Now, I didn't say weakness. Meekness is not weak. Let me say that again. Get my teeth in. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is the ability to show grace under pressure. And that describes Jesus' actions throughout the whole of the road to his imminent death at the cross. And Jesus' power contrasts starkly with Pilate's because Jesus' power, Jesus' authority is understated. Sometimes it's silent compared to Pilate's overt claims. Jesus only refers to his authority very obliquely in verse 11 in response to Pilate's overreaching, overstated claims. In fact, Jesus' power and authority is never seen clearer than in the moments of his darkest personal sufferings. Those moments we glimpse here of apparent powerlessness to effect change to his own situation. The vulnerability of being exposed to the baying crowd. There's no sign of a friendly face or a familiar voice in the crowd. This is shortly after, you'll remember, his own right-hand man, Peter, had denied him just as Jesus had told him he would do. Where Pilate is concerned and driven by fear, Jesus is driven on by love and obedience. Pilate concerned about what he might lose. Jesus knows what he's about to lose, his life. And yet he carries on for what he's going to gain, which is obedience to his father, kept intact, and the salvation of people who will believe in him, you and I. We know from the word of God that Jesus could at any moment have called the whole thing off and he could have summoned armies of angels, but he didn't. Out of obedience to his Father, out of pure unconditional love for his created beings, yes, even you and I. Jesus is willing to place himself on Judgment Street, this place called Gabbatha, from where judgments were pronounced, where lives were either saved 
or sentenced because he knew that to get to Golgotha, the place of the skull, a.k.a. Death Hill, he had to go via Gabatha. The one who will be the judge was willing himself to be judged. Just imagine the king of glory being judged by this flawed man called Pilate. There will be a day though when Jesus will return as judge, the judge, the eternal judge. And he's the only one who could carry out that role. He's uniquely uniquely qualified to be judge because he went to Gabbatha and then to Calvary. He who knew no sin became sin. Pilate could find no fault in him. He repeatedly tried to free him, but a combination of peer pressure and mob rule contributed to Pilate's insecurities, and under fear for his own reputation, he capitulated to the crowd's murderous intent. The writer of our vlog series book, uh, Carl Beach, uh, poses these two questions for us today as we finish. Firstly, how many times have we not told the truth because, frankly, it's easier to be the nice guy? Secondly, are you your own person or are you a crowd follower? Let's pray. Lord, help us today to be bold in our faith, to stand up for right and truth and honesty. Help us to hear your voice above the voice of the crowd. Amen.